Well, good morning. I forgot to do something I meant to do during the uh, message focus. Oh, good morning. Oh, my goodness gracious. I, can, I, can we get the coffee back soon? We're going to have to serve it outside, I guess. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. I'll give you a 50% for that. Uh, I forgot to pray for Becky Zubowitz. Uh, our drummer, Rick, and Becky, his wife, have COVID, and uh, Rick is now running 102-degree fever. Becky is in the ICU on a ventilator. And it's been on a ventilator for about a week, is that right, more or less? And so I want to lift them up in prayer. I meant to do that earlier today. So would you join me as we pray for them? Father, we want to lift up uh, Rick and Becky. And Becky, if she's in ICU, we pray you'd give all the nurses, even one of the nurses from our church that's there, uh, special insight and wisdom. We pray that you would heal her. Lord, we ask as a church, we ask for a miracle that you would restore her quickly, that the doctors would be amazed that your hand is on her right now. We ask that for Rick too, Father, that you, uh, Lord, would work with your spirit through and in their bodies and change what's going on and, Lord, bring restoration. We ask that uh, through the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for those moments. So today we're going to talk about the suffering of Christ, and I want to read 1 Peter 4.13 from the New Century Version. If you've never read the New Century Version, um, uh, the NIV, uh, which is my favorite translation, uh, is about a 12th grade early college reading level. New Century Version is about a 7th grade reading level. Most Americans read on a seventh grade reading level. So for those of you who struggle sometimes, the New Century Version, because it uh, 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 takes the, the original translation and, and tries to, uh, uh, well, you'll see. Okay, let me read this one. So be happy, and in the NIV it says rejoice, but be happy that you are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Well, that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Be happy that you are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Why? So that you will be happy and full of joy when Christ comes again in glory. See, one of the things about sharing Christ's sufferings on this earth is that we realize that we are not in heaven yet. If God would allow people to hurt Jesus and to betray Jesus, and to reject Jesus, there are going to be times in life that God, in His free will, in in the freedom of people to choose sin, people have permission, or not really permission, but, but they can hurt us. But God says in His Word that no matter how much you go through hurt and pain and trial and struggle, that He can work out even the most evil thing in your life. Even somebody who did something so terrible to you that you don't even want to tell the story. Even the situation that happened that you wish you could just remove. Maybe it's even you, something that you did, a failure that you had that you still grieve over. Maybe it's a loss. And God says that he can even use that most painful thing. That thing that kept you up at night crying. That thing that anytime you still think about it, you struggle. He can use even that for his good. And that is what we should remember when we think about the suffering of Jesus. To understand that the suffering of Jesus reminds us that there's suffering on this earth. But one day when we see Jesus again, there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more struggle, no more getting out of bed and going, oh, as you get up. Right? Right? I'm more animated as I get older, right? I pop, and yet I don't glow like a glow stick. Have you heard that one? <laughs> right? So years ago, I taught school. These are, these are pictures from that school. This is 1993-94, which doesn't seem that long ago to me until last night I counseled a couple who's getting married, and she said, oh, I was born after that date. Right? So you forget. And in those years, I loved teaching at this school. I really enjoyed it up in Titusville. The reason I ended up in Titusville was because I had taught in West Palm Beach, and they had a massive layoff that year. And since I was a new teacher, they laid me off, and I felt like we should move to Brevard County, which is kind of why I'm here today, right? 
And so I taught at this school, and at the end of a couple of years, now I did some crazy things when I taught school, like I wanted to teach the kids inertia, and I got permission to have them push the bus in the parking lot to teach them about inertia. You probably couldn't get away with that today. Um, dropped uh, watermelons off of buildings. It was awesome. Anyway, but um, so all this stuff. But at the end of a couple of years, they had budget cuts too, and they had to cut our salaries. And I said, I, I don't think I can live on that salary. And I knew something needed to change. At the same time, a church in Melbourne called me. I had been working with youth. I, in college, had been a youth pastor. And this church called me from Melbourne and asked if I would come and be their youth pastor. What's interesting about that is one of the folks who came last night was in that first youth group. And this guy called me and asked if I'd come. I would not have even been open to that if I did not have a push from a situation where I felt like a failure. I felt like maybe I did something. I did all that second guessing of maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I should have, maybe I... And yet God used that situation to push me and to pull me there. And then God used some circumstances there then to, to move me back to youth ministry up in Titusville. And, and God... Uh, uh, used there. And then there was a push there. Pastors get pushed a lot. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that. But most of you have been pushed. You've been in a job where all of a sudden, you know, you got a push because suddenly they said, you're not going to have a salary after today. And you're like, oh, that's a push, right? We're having layoffs. If you work at the space center, they do that just for fun once in a while, right? Just, oh, we're going to, we're going to reorganize. What? Because <laughs> you know what reorganize means. <laughs> Your name's no longer in the organization. You're unorganized, right? So, so there's those times in life where you have that change. And then that led to, to starting another church. And then at that church, there was a push. And then we started Surfside. And heck, you know, maybe one day you're going to push me out. That's all good. But God, let me tell you, God will use those pushes in your life to change you. And sometimes those pushes aren't just job related. Sometimes they're life related. Maybe a bankruptcy where you just can't handle what's going on and you don't have a choice. Maybe a divorce that you were not part of. You just got to be on the other side of and you, and you were led to a place where you couldn't do anything about it. Maybe a situation with one of your children where you're devastated by their choices and their decisions, but you can't fix it. You can just be there. There are so many ways in life that we suffer through things. And when we're going through it, listen, when I left this job, when, they told, when I knew that I was going to have to leave, can I tell you something? I was devastated. I thought nothing better will ever come up. And by the way, I loved teaching that. I had so much fun. Crazy teacher. In the back of this one is Ernest, giant Ernest. I had a thousand Ernest P. Worrell masks somebody gave me. Drove all the other teachers crazy. Maybe that's why. I'm not. You may be at a point in your life where something's going on and you cannot see any light. And you think, how in the world is this going to work out for the good? Can I tell you from 25 years ago, I look back and I see how God even used pain and distress and struggle and heartache to push me to a place that I might not have ever gone. I felt like I was in the valley of the shadow of death. Can I tell you, when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, the only place you can look is up. See, God allowed Jesus to go to the cross. The ultimate goal was to save us. He wanted a relationship with you and me. And if nothing else, we should remember that. That's what that verse talks about. Remember that. And he'll allow us to go through trials. And through suffering. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. I wish he had said you might. But he said you would. If you're a Christian and you're really trying to follow God, there are going to be days that you struggle. That you have a hard time. There's going to be relationships that struggle. You're in the world. This is not heaven yet. But he will use your pain and struggle. And if you'll let him, he won't make you. But if you let him, if you'll follow his will, he will work even those things out for the good. That trial in your life can become a testimony to what God can do, even through pain and struggle and sorrow. So let's talk today about what Jesus endured for us. First, he was beaten and belittled. Mark 15, 16 through 20 says this, The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace. 
that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. Time out. Now, I never knew this. I never knew what I read this week. I mean, I've studied, went to seminary, got my master's degree, got my doctorate, studied scripture. When it says here, a company, whole company of soldiers, that means, listen to this, because no movie has ever shown this. It was between 200 and 600 soldiers. 200 and between 200 and 600 soldiers were part of what takes place next. So the scene is much more intense, much more chaotic, much more mocking than you've probably ever gathered unless you knew that. They put a purple robe on him. Remember, that was a sign of royalty. Lydia in the Bible was the seller of purple. They put a purple robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns, and set it on him. In Florida, that would be related to Bougainvillea. How many of you have ever trimmed a Bougainvillea? We had a guy here last night that went to the hospital from trimming a Bougainvillea plant, okay? You, you, those thorns. So imagine they twisted that, something like that, together, and then I doubt they gently placed, they shoved it on his head. And they began to call out, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. And basically that means again and again they struck him, again and again they spit on him. Hundreds of soldiers spitting and hitting and mocking. And Jesus endured it. Falling on their knees... They paid homage to him. So you can imagine it was like a show for them. They were young soldiers showing off to each other. Oh, you know, you just came into Jerusalem last week on a donkey and everybody was throwing palm fronds down. Look at you now. We thought we were going to have to keep you from being king, but look at who you are now. You can't come against Rome. And the soldiers realized this threat that they thought is gone. See, they thought he was coming in to take over. By the way, that's what the disciples sought too, so they weren't really off base. Remember, the disciples were still confused. They were like, well, I thought we were taking over here. I was looking at the temple stones and thinking, this is going to be a great palace for us. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. When they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his clothes on him. By the way, this is after he had been beaten till his back was hamburger meat. And I don't know if you've ever had a cloth put on a wound and then had it peeled off. They let him out to crucify him. This would have been about a four-man crucifixion team that did this all the time. These were insensitive. They had become immune to it. They had done it so often. They felt like these people weren't really even humans. They were, there was a reason that they were condemned to death. Would have been a centurion over them. And then the four people would have grabbed his legs and, and put him on the cross and nailed him to the cross, nailed his wrist to the cross. Back then they considered the hands all the way to this part, what we call a wrist. And none of this was fair. Have you gone through some unfairness in your life? Where you were falsely accused? Where maybe you lost a job and it wasn't fair? And you thought, this is just not right. God can use even that because he understands unfairness. He understands the unfairness that happens in your life. He understands the unfairness that happens in all of our lives. And when life is unfair, he understands unfairness. I want to encourage you to do this. If you have something where you feel like there was something unfair in your life, and, and those things haunt us sometimes. When you think of that, I, I want you to use that and come before God in prayer. And just like Jesus did, said, thy will be done. I want you to say, God, use even this. God, I release this to you. That person that did that thing, that situation that happened, it was unfair. He knows what it's like to have... Un You're in a world of unfairness. Unfair things are going to happen to you. By the way, even failing yourself sometimes seems unfair. I don't know if you've ever looked in the mirror and thought... just not right 
So release that. Imagine yourself say, he understands unfairness. Say, God, you understand unfairness. Lord, I release that to you. You can use that. Number two, he was tortured and taunted. So he's beaten and belittled, so he understands unfairness. He was tortured and taunted. There's a man named Horatio Spafford. And Horatio uh, uh, was alive right before. He, he had kids right before the Chicago fire. His son died. He had four other daughters. And then the Chicago fire came and wiped out his business. So he decided they would move to England. That was kind of his best thing. So he used some of the last of his money and got it together. And he had some business affairs to finish up. And he sent his wife and his girls off to England. And on the way, their ship was struck by another ship and sunk quickly. All perished except for his wife. It wasn't too many months later that he was on a ship. They were, he and his wife were going back to England this time together. And as they came to the place, to the area where his daughters drowned, he came up with a song that you are very familiar with called, It Is Well With My Soul. He understood that no matter what happened, even though it did not seem fair, even though it seemed unjust, even though life had gotten so difficult and so many tragedies over and over and over in his life, he said, but I trust you, God. It's well with my soul. He understood that life is not just about what we see here. One day there will be no more goodbyes because of what Jesus did. One day in heaven, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering. Your best day on earth is just a taste of the joy of heaven. The most you've ever laughed at one of Dave's bad jokes, which is not much, but the most you've ever laughed is just a touch of the joy you'll see in heaven. So the sorrows of this earth fade away and it's well with our soul. Why? Because we understand that Jesus has made a way for us to spend eternity in paradise, in heaven. This is not heaven. And when we choose to try to put heaven's requirements on earth, we're always disappointed. God allows things to happen to teach us. He allows tragedy. He allowed the early church to be persecuted. Why? To spread the gospel. You and I are here today because the early church, Nero, came in and persecuted the early church. And they took off all over the world. And you and I heard the gospel because of that evil. But I'm sure for those who were tortured by Nero, they thought that doesn't seem right. God will use even a bad president in our country, to teach us about him. A certain man from Cyrene, which is in North Africa, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the inn from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. Oh, by the way, I want to say something. Don't assume that I'm saying the president you're thinking of is the bad one. It's probably the opposite of who you're thinking, so just so you know. All right, just want to make sure you knew that. All right. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. By the way, Jesus would have carried that beam. It would have been about 100 pounds. And after Jesus was beaten and had lost so much blood, he could not carry it. Jesus must have been pretty strong. I mean, when he chased them out of the temple, they left. That tells you a little bit about him. You know, they showed Jesus as this wimp in so many stories. Jesus was not a wimp. He would not have survived the beating. And the guys in the temple that he chased out would not have left if Jesus came in and gone, Okay, guys, I want you to leave now. <laughs> All right, let's go. They didn't have glasses, but you know, right? So Jesus was strong. We know that. He was a carpenter. We know that. And so he's carrying the car. He can no longer carry it. And here, this man... Simon is said, hey, you come carry his cross. And so he carried the beam all the way up the hill. By the way, they're pretty sure that this man also became a Christian. If you read in Romans 16, 13, we're pretty sure that it's the same person talked about in the early church that was a witness of Christ to others. So even the injustice 
of Simon having to carry the cross literally changed his life. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. Myrrh. I seem to remember myrrh. God loves foreshadowing. In just a few months, we'll celebrate Jesus' birth. And we'll talk about what the wise men brought, the foreshadowing of what Jesus would do, the suffering, the hurting, the pain. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. And it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. By the way, if you look at Psalms 22, we're going to show that in a minute. You'll find that dividing of the clothes in the prophecy about the Messiah. They crucified two rebels. Oh, excuse me. The written notice of charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. By the way, he could have. If he could save Lazarus from a grave coming off the cross, wouldn't it have even been difficult? If he could walk on water, he could walk on air. But he didn't because he sacrificed for us. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross. Listen to what they say. So we can see him and believe. Listen. He had shown them. They knew that Lazarus rose from the dead. They had seen Jesus do miracles, and they did not believe. Do you really think if he came off the cross, they would believe? They didn't want to believe. Religious leaders in the presence of Jesus did not even recognize Jesus. And here's the caution for us. As you go through life, don't miss what God's trying to do. As you go through life, don't miss what God's doing. It even says when Jesus went up into heaven, it says that people saw him go up into heaven, and then it says, and some doubted. That means there were people there that were watching Jesus go up and said, that didn't just happen. That's just people. So realize that no matter what God does, if you don't pay attention, if you don't allow him to soften your heart, you'll miss it. You'll be focused on the wrong thing. There are churches today that are fighting over music. They're fighting over what kind of music they're singing. I was in a church where people would sit down even any time a modern hymn was sung. And that church is dying today. You know why? Because they thought church was a country club. They forgot church was about reaching out to people. It wasn't just about our comforts and what we like. It's about, God, what do you want us to do? By the way, we have three things coming up for what you want to do. We've got the fall festival where you can help and reach our community. We're going to be going to the Boys and Girls Club next month and helping them with their uh, garden and their uh, refinishing some of their benches to be a witness to them. And then in December, we're going to go to one of the assisted living homes, and we're going to stand in the courtyard and sing carols, and probably badly, by the way, Dave, just so you know, I want to. These opportunities to reach out. Why? Because you can miss what God wants you to do because you're so busy with your own stuff. They were so busy with their own stuff, they said, hey, we'll believe him if he comes off the cross. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land till three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. I'm just going to do it in English. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By the way, this was a song. They would have sung this during Purim every year. It was like starting a song off. It would be like if I said to you, two all-beef patties, special sauce, you would know what I was talking about, right? If I said, da-da-da-da-da, you would know what I was talking about. Two McDonald's references in one sermon. There you go. You would know what I was talking about. If I said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, you would know what I was talking about. You would sing the song. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, God cannot look on sin, but Jesus was also pointing to Psalms 22. And if you get an opportunity, read it. It talks about the cross. It describes what Jesus experienced. Jesus was letting them know, look at what you're seeing. And what you're seeing is a prophecy of me. 
When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. They missed it. Some ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said with a loud cry. Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So it wasn't an earthquake. Top to bottom. And let me tell you about this. You know why God had the temple curtain torn? It's because only the priest could go into the temple. And the Bible points out that Jesus is our high priest. You don't need to come to a priest. You don't need to come to a pastor to have access to God. You go straight through Jesus. You, you don't have to have other people to pray to in order to come to God. Why? Because that, that curtain was split so that you, through Jesus Christ, can come into God's presence without help. You don't have to ask Mary to bring you there. You don't have to ask one of the saints to bring you there. You don't have to bury a statue in your front yard to bring you there. What? The temple was split top to bottom, that curtain, to give us access to God. That's pointed out for a reason, to remind us that He is our high priest. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, remember, these guys were used to this. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Even though the religious leaders missed it, Somebody who should have been bitter, who should have been insensitive to criminals. He heard people cry out every day. That was his job. He was there at the cross and he said, he really is God. See, Mark would point that out because when he was writing early on, this would first be read to the Romans. And Romans would know that a centurion would not care about who was dying on a cross unless there was something real. Don't miss the reality of what God's doing around you. Ask God to show you what he's done for you. He endured pain so we could know him. Too often we're so focused on getting our own way, our own prayers answered, that we don't recognize that God can even use the hurts in our lives to be a blessing. Finally today. He was beaten and belittled, tortured and taunted, and finally his death and burial. So Joseph, and this was prophesied in Isaiah 53, by the way. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone, and next week we get to talk about that stone rolling the other way. He rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Why would Jesus do this? There's a story published in the early 1900s from the 1800s in a Japanese newspaper. In Japanese literature. I don't know if it was a newspaper. And it's a true story about a man who lived on a plane overlooking the ocean. And, and in, the, in the valley below towards the ocean was a, a big village and the man was putting his sheaths of rice together and he got them all together. And then his grandson was helping him and he said to his grandson, light the sheaths on fire. And his grandson said, grandfather, are you crazy? And the grandfather grabbed the torch and lit his own rice on fire, ruining his crops. The grandson thought his grandpa was crazy, but he started lighting them too. They lit all of his crops on fire. And as they began to burn, the townspeople all came up to help to put up the fire. And they came up the hill to put out the fire. And as they came, they said, what happened? How did a fire start? And the grandfather said, I started the fire. They said, are you crazy? You've ruined all your crops. And all the grandfather did is point to the sea. And as the people turned around, they turned around right as a tsunami came in and wiped out everything that was left in the village. But all the people survived because the man gave up his livelihood to save all of the people. What Jesus did is so much greater than that for us. The sacrifice that we give, the things that we do, listen, you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't do enough religious deeds to do what Jesus did. He paid it all. 
but you have to receive what he's done. It's a free gift, the Bible says. In John 3.16, it says very simply, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. You know, we read that so often. I, I want to do something today. Where it says world, I want out loud for you to say your name. If you're at home and you're watching online, you say it out loud right where you're at. If, you're, if your cousin's sleeping in the house, they'll just think you're crazy saying your name out loud, okay? So here we go. When I get to world, you say your name. Ready? For God so loved... For God so loved Eric. That he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes, that word for belief is not just a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. It's what we do when we sit in a chair. It's the idea of faith. Whoever believes, whoever says, Jesus, I trust you. It's not just being able to talk about him. It's not information. The Pharisees had information. Satan has information about Jesus. Satan knows more scripture than you and I. And yet... We put our faith in him. God, I trust you. I surrender my life to you. Whoever believes in him will not perish. He won't die, but have eternal life. That's the hope of the gospel. Why? So that that very first verse comes true, that we look forward, we understand the suffering of Jesus, and we live it sometimes, understanding that when he comes, or when we go to him one day, that the day that Eric says, what does this button do? Oh, hello, Jesus. I guess that wasn't a good button to push. I've always said that's probably the way I'm going to go. Of course, we do have a guy in our church that has touched 440 volts twice in a row. If you don't know Bob, somehow Jesus has not taken him home yet. He's left him here for illustrations for the pastor, apparently. Bob was messing with a, a breaker, and he got shocked on 440, and then he thought, I must have done it wrong, and he went and reached and did it again. Twice in a row, found himself across the room Waking up. On the day that you maybe do something dumb, or the day that your doctor finally says you can go no further, on that day, when you close your eyes here, you will open your eyes in his presence. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. There's no in-between. There's no waiting. There's no time of, of just sitting around. You're in his presence. On that day. And that's why we can have joy in this world. Because the suffering we endure. Number one is nothing like what Jesus endured. But he understands our suffering. And one day. No more suffering. No more sorrow. No more goodbyes. No more injustice. No more terrible situations. One day all of that goes away. And it's just a distant memory. In the light of his love and grace and fellowship with others and blessing. The perfection of heaven that we look forward to. That's why we don't put our hope in the things of this earth. That's why we don't fully trust the things of this earth no matter how wonderful they are. We thank God for them, but we don't put our faith in them. We put our faith in him. Why? Because he gave everything for our sins. And we need that. On our very best day, we don't have it all together. But the Bible says, but he gives us his righteousness anyway. He makes you righteous. If you're a Christian, you no longer have to say, I'm a sinner. You can say, I was a sinner, but I was a sinner saved by grace. No longer am I a sinner. I was saved by grace. So I'm a sinner who was saved by grace. God, thank you for that righteousness you've given to me as a free gift. If you're here today, you're watching online, and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. And I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. I explained it, I think, very clearly. But there's even a prayer at the end. A prayer does not save you, but a prayer spoken with a heart that agrees with the prayer does save you as you surrender your life to him. So that prayer is at the end of the notes today. You can pray that prayer. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're watching online, you can send me a note, an email, whatever's easy, and let us know about your decision. If you're ready to take the next step in baptism, you can let us know too. That's the way you identify with what you've done. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today, and then we'll have our time of giving. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word and your power. Lord, thank you that you love us. Father, I thank you that, that even though we walk in sin, Lord, even though the most perfect of us sin, that, Lord, you've taken all of our sins and you took the punishment on the cross. It wasn't just a physical suffering. It was a spiritual suffering because our sin was placed on you. 
Lord, thank you for your sacrifice because of your love for us. Lord, I pray that those of us who've been Christians would recognize what you've done and today walk in that love. Lord, not looking for the world for satisfaction, but looking to you for satisfaction so that then we can share that joy with the world. Lord, make us walk in love so that others can see that you're real. In Jesus' name, amen.